Staff and Summer. I'm with the Northern Arizona Climate Change Alliance in Flagstaff, Arizona. And we're here today to um, talk about March Media Madness, which is a campaign to get the media's attention and to elevate their coverage of climate change. I'm a mostly retired professor at Northern Arizona University. My background is in ecology and I've done a lot of outreach about climate change. Um, so why is the March Media Madness campaign such an important thing? It, it evolved really out of a conversation that we had with our climate protest group because every month we were doing a protest, we were sending our, letter, our um, press releases to the newspaper. And after the first time, we just got no more coverage. And we started talking, why, is, why isn't climate the headline every day? And we had major frustration. We decided to come up with this campaign and we're hoping that lots of people write letters. I know many people have already written their first letter or two and um, the idea is to flood your media, whether it's the print media or radio station or a local TV station even, um, or social media with posts and letters to the editor and op-eds and press releases every day during the month of March. If many people are doing this, they will get lots of different communications expressing concern about the climate. And it may seem like a lot to ask the, the media to cover climate every day, but really it is it is a, such a global crisis. It's the biggest crisis our species has ever faced. And it's already wreaking havoc on the globe's ecosystems, on all species, including ours, it's shifting our agricultural systems to new areas. Farmers are having to change to new crops. It is reducing the GDP of every country around the globe. People can't get fire insurance anymore in parts of California because of wildfires. I mean, it is affecting everything. And so I would suggest though also, we don't just cover all of the crises and the negative aspects of climate change, but cover things about the solutions to climate change. Write about your concern about putting in more wind power or more, more photovoltaic systems in your vicinity. Um, talk about if you are putting in uh, an electric furnace or converting to an electric car or you know whatever it happens to be that's about climate is a perfectly good topic for a letter to the editor. And I know we've got Alfred Hogan with us today and he is a, a journalist and historian. And he's also, also happens to be writing the biography of Greta Thunberg right now. So um, he's very keyed into all these climate things and as well as to how to communicate with the media. So I'm going to hand it over to Alfred and let him tell everybody about how to most effectively write letters to the editor and op-eds to your local media. Alfred. Uh, thank you, Professor Summer. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Alfred Robert Hogan. I'm a longtime science journalist and media historian in Maryland, USA. And I worked at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in, in Washington, DC, a pro-vegan organization and started their writers group. And we did lots of op-ed pieces and letters to the editor as, as one of the mainstays of, of what our, our function was within the PCRM. And I've done op-ed pieces outside of PCRM as well, but that that uh, is, is an instructive uh, experience. We had arrangements with Scripps Howard and Knight Ritter Tribune to take our pieces uh, at least once per month to send out to various newspapers that were clients of theirs. Uh, that is one way to get around the exclusivity requirement that most newspapers have for op-eds and letters to the editor is to have an arrangement like that. But that was 
really difficult to to arrange and uh anyway but i just mentioned that as as way of background that was from uh our group group existed uh under my direction from 1997 to 2002 at any rate so the idea of of op-eds actually dates back to 1921 in the new york evening world newspaper and the one of the editors there came up with the idea he was a three-time pulitzer prize winner and he he also won uh, four hundred seventy thousand dollars in a poker game with some rich people once so he's a very colorful character uh his, his name the last name is swope s-w-o-p-e and he came up with the idea of an opposite of the editorial page so it's the page facing the editorial page which is the main opinion page that expresses the newspaper's views and usually runs letters to the editor has the masthead of the newspaper on it with the staff box and the policies of the newspaper uh, uh for, for people to uh to look at so so opposite that would be both regular columnists and eventually uh, guest columnists. Uh, th it actually took a long time, uh, almost 50 years, for the idea to expand to include outside voices. And the New York Times expanded that uh, concept on uh, Monday, 21 September 1970. It's actually the first you know, modern concept op-ed page. And uh, that was that was uh, a, a combination of regular columnists and and uh, guest guest columnists. Now, the the idea for a column is to have a, a piece of anywhere from five hundred to twelve hundred words. Although, because of shortening attention spans, the 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 the, the in most cases the the maximum length is seven hundred fifty words. Now there are Sunday think piece sections like the Washington Post has an outlook section and the Baltimore Sun has a perspective section, for instance, that, that are, are, are a little bit more flexible in terms of longer pieces, but probably you should aim at 500 to 750 words. And that's not much space to convey a, a, a great deal of information. Um, so you, you, wanna, you wanna have a, a really powerful lead uh, a catchy hook is sometimes called to start the piece out with, and you want to tie back to that in your last graph, so sort of to bring it together uh, thematically. Uh, to uh, yeah, and then in, in between, you present uh, things like uh, examples and illustrations, statistics, uh, scientific evidence, expert testimony. Uh, you try to write in a, in an engaging way that will not be overly pendant pedantic or, 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 or sound, no, no offense to Professor Summer, sound, sound like a, a professor, not, not, not his type of professor, but, but the, bo the boring kind of professors, the, uh, the Ben Stein uh, uh, stereotype of, of professors. So you, you want to make it lively and engaging. Uh, you want to make it so somewhat provocative. Newspapers sometimes like pieces that sort of push the envelope and are something that has not been expressed in their pages before. And you know, I mean, recently uh, on Tuesday 9, February, for instance, the scientists at three British universities plus Harvard University in Massachusetts published a study in environmental research saying 8.7 million people died in 2018 because of fossil fuel air pollution. And this did not get very much media pickup, you know, uh, as usual. And uh, so, so that that would be a topic that that you could do an, an op-ed on. It would at, at PCRM we we generally had op-eds by scientist and writer. I, I like to credit the writer. Uh, it, it, some people just ghostwrite. Uh, I don't think that's a, uh, ethical or fair to the writer. But but so we would have the the the, the doctor, uh, you know, review the the piece and make any changes that, that he or she wanted to make and then we would you know put the piece out so sometimes having an authority like that can be helpful to get an op-ed in a newspaper as well um, I do have some resources that I can can share with you if I learn how to make title uh, cards that that or, or PowerPoint uh, cards that would uh, be helpful to to augment this I, I'll be happy to 
share the resources with with anyone who uh, who wants that uh, information. Uh, now, on letters to the editor, the the most newspapers limit their length to about 150 to 200 words, so that gives you basically one point, main point to to, to focus on in your in your letter to the editor, which is supposed to respond to something that has been in print. Uh, so if you see a story that has uh, a relevance to the climate crisis and the climate crisis wasn't mentioned in the piece, uh, like you know with the Texas uh, winter storm or the California wildfires, and of course Arizona was affected by wildfires as well, uh, you know, and, and they're not e explaining the environmental consequences uh, and, and origins uh, of, of these problems. Uh, that that would give you an opening for a letter to the editor as well. Um, so let's see here. What else do I have? Uh, so so the, the idea with the with the op eds is to give an you know a, some additional perspective that is outside of the newspaper's uh, you know staff uh, ex expertise and to um, you know, augment the public uh, discourse uh, to, to sort of stimulate people to react to it and hopefully to get letters to the editor based on your, your op-ed piece. Uh, letters to the editor are, are easier to get into papers because they're shorter and there's, you know, more opportunity. It doesn't take up as much real estate uh, uh, on, on the uh, newspaper's pages, so you have a better shot of getting in. and. Uh, so I, I, I can, I can uh, uh, the, the, the pieces should be as much as possible based on fact, not emotion, but to try to, you know, to, to, to lay out the, the case, but to do it in an engaging, you know, clever uh, way. Um, th those are so, so, some of the points I have here. So um, I, I wish I had the ability to do the PowerPoint. I could really improve the uh, quality of uh, information I'm, I'm relaying to you here. But anyway, that, that's, that's, those are a few key points. Thank you so much, Alfred. Um, I'm Hazel Chandler, and I represent Elders Climate Action, who's a co-sponsor of this, and also Union of Concerned Scientists. I serve as a uh, consultant and the Arizona coordinator. Um, I want to just kind of build a little bit on Arizona specific op-eds, uh, letters to the editor, and then maybe some other ideas for some outreach to, to media people across our state. Um, each of our newspapers, almost every, every newspaper has specific criteria for op-eds and letters to the editor and specific criteria for submitting and um, I don't have all, I haven't looked at all of the, the across the state newsletter or newspapers, but I, I looked at um, Tucson Daily Sun and Arizona Republic. Um, the Arizona Republic uh, requires opt-eds to be 550 words and the Tucson Daily Sun 600 words. So they're relatively short uh, submissions. Um, letters to the editor for the Arizona Republic are 200 words and Tucson Daily Star are 160 words. So uh, Tucson, I mean, Arizona Republic gives you a few more words. And let me tell you, I just wrote an op-ed and um, it um, actually, Doug wrote part of it and I added to it. Uh, Doug Bland with Interfaith Power and Light. But um, it's really hard to stay within 200 words. So um, hopefully most of the newspapers across the state are 200, not 160. Um, both the Tucson Daily Star and the Arizona Republic both have a really, really easy link to submit your op-eds. And um, in the document you're going to get and the follow-up email, there will be a link to a document on the criteria for Arizona Republic and the, and the uh, <clears throat> Tucson Daily Star, and it'll have a, um, an actual link to just go to submit your op-ed. Um, you have to put your name and your address and your phone number and your email 
um, in, in there. They will not accept it unless all of the information is filled out. Um, they verify that it's real. Um, before my, I got an op-ed published uh, yesterday and before um, they published it, they verified that my email was a good email. Um, so I just want to make sure you get all of that information. They say that to expect a phone call, but I did not get a phone call. But, um, you know, they do want to make sure you're a real person. Um, and so that's really important. Um, the le letters to the editor, and these are kind of the words of the, the Arizona Republic, but I thought it was really good. They, they need to be relevant, provocative, constructive, timely, passionate, find a use humor. Um, and this is something I added, but I think that if you can, you're much more apt to get something published if you find a way to, to tug at a heartstring, to bring yourself into it, whether it's your own experience or, or whatever, I think really, really important. Um, when you're thinking about doing an op-ed uh, or a letter to the editor, I cannot recommend enough that you check out Union of Concerned Scientists um, how, on their Science Rising site, and I'll, I'll, we'll send you a link with the follow-up um, uh, email, has great like one or two pagers on how to write a letter to the editor, how to write an op-ed. You've got it right in front of you. They give you some examples of how to use language and how to take facts and then turn it into something you would use in the op-ed. So I highly recommend that, that you pull up those, review them, and feel free to use them. Um, if you need if you need facts on the Union of Concerned Scientists site, there is also a lot of um, blog posts and and research articles that are very um, they're not written in heavy scientific form, but they're in understandable language. So you're free to to take a take a. a comment or two from one of those reports, like the heat reports might be a really good one to use for Arizona because we have such a heat problem. Um, there's some some really good quotes in that. So feel free to use those, those um, 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 feel, feel free to use those resources. Another thing, especially on op-eds that has been successful in Arizona, is um, several uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, our Tucson uh, group of our youth the climate um, uh, coalition, and um, someone else, there were four people, um, came together and did an op and wrote a joint op ed on the impacts of climate change and health. Um, it was really excellent. Um, uh, one of the physicians for social responsibilities doctor took the lead, but actually the the article the op ed was really written mainly by Kyle Klein, who's one of our youth activists, and uh, it it was really powerful. So I think we have huge opportunities to come together and use our expertise with our activists and our, um, our, our activists and our, um, our scientists to do some pretty amazing things that will help, um, you know, get some more attention to our, to our um, um, issues here in the state. Um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about the, the actual op-ed that I um, submitted for, for Doug Bland with Interfaith Power and Light. And he, he gave me the template, so I, I'm not taking any real responsibility, but I did change it a little bit to meet my 
to meet my needs and I was happy that it was published. Um, I just happened to be um, in Legislative District 20, which is um, in Legislative District 20, um, Paul Boyer is, is our, um, our Senator and he has been a Republican that has actually taken some pretty uh, interesting stance on a couple different bills and been the uh, person that, that, um, that actually killed a, a bill that, a couple bills that were not really in the best interest of Arizona, one being the permanent early voting list bill. Uh, the purging of the permanent early voting list bill, although it's coming back up. And uh, so Doug was looking for somebody in LD20 to be the person to write that uh, op-ed. And I said I would do it. Um, but I just wanted to share a little bit about what it, it, it is because it kind of shows how we bring our personal uh, thoughts and feelings into it, and then how we actually call out an elected official to take some action. Um, and I wish I had had put it, could put it up on the screen, but um, I'm going. To, I'm just going to quickly read it because it's short. Um, it says multiple bills at the Arizona Legislature this season appear to be a coordinated effort to stop the Arizona Corporation Commission from enacting clean energy policies that will protect God's creation, ensure a healthier environment for future generations. As a faith person, one bill in particular goes too far. House Bill 2737 is an attack on public safety, public health and on consumers who rely on the ACC to protect them. This legislation allows even one lawmaker to object to ACC policies and forth, force a, le uh, a lengthy legal review along with the possibility of subjecting them to bu budget cuts. I am extremely concerned also about uh, House Bill 2248 that seems to be an effort to kill these clean energy policies. As a person of faith, I believe Paul Boyer understands God's commandments and our sacred duty to protect life. I urge Senator Boyer to have the courage to take another broad stand uh, against this legislation that would do harm to his constituents and future generations. And I signed it with Hazel Chandler, um, Elders Climate Action and Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, because I was doing this for Doug, I did the faith aspect, but any way you can personalize it is really important. And also then specifically calling out, Paul, you know, Paul has, has been, has had the, um, courage to stand up on a couple other bad bills and 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 appear uh, appearing to his appealing to his humanity I think is a really important step um, one other thing I want to talk about is that Gabrielle and I Gabrielle Lawrence and I have been working on that I think is a really important tactic it's worked really well last last year when we were leading up to Earth Week, um, and that's what I would call tag teaming re reporters. Uh, the Arizona Republic has several reporters that specialize in writing climate related and environmental related, um, uh, inf you know, um, report uh, articles. And uh, Gabrielle has reached out to one of the reporters and, and asked him to write an article. Um, and um, actually, I then followed up. She was re representing a citizen climate lobby. I followed up and wrote uh, representing Elders Climate Action and Union of Concerned Scientists. I actually took her email that she used to that reporter and did some quoting from it and then built my own 
a take on that same storyline, but did the same, did a similar ask for them to do a story. We're still waiting to hear back. I've had one email back from him, so I know that he's paying attention and he's reading the emails. But I think this tag teaming can be a, an important way to get um, the attention of um, um, of the reporters. Um, we had a, a strong relationship uh, with Aaron Stone, who was a reporter for the Arizona Republic, um, and worked with her on a number of different stories. And, and she would call me if anything was going on, or you know, I would call her if things were going on. But she, she left, so we now have to build a new relationship. So it's about building those relationships with the reporters. And the little newspapers love you to build those relationships. If you have a newspaper, um, I worked a lot with the Globe Miami Times uh, newspaper when I was still working up in Gila County and with the Pace and Roundup. And um, I, it took me a little while, but once I found, was able to build those relationships, they'd publish anything I sent them. So I encourage you to use March as the month to, to build those relationships. So, yes, Bonnie. Okay, so I was monitoring the chat box and we had a question from Frank who wants to know, how does that letter to the editor get to the front page? I wish I knew. <laughs> and well, maybe it's those relationships. I think it's building those relationships and then asking them to take that letter to the editor and turn it into a real article. I think that's that's the answer. You know, um, you, you can only say something a little something in two hundred words, but if you can get them to take the idea behind your two hundred words and turn it into a real story, I think that's really important. Um, well, and, and Frank, um, that's where letter uh, where uh, press releases come in, really. In a press release, you've got to study a little bit more detail and, and um, provide a good basis for them to take your words either directly or to take the information and create a story of their own from it. But that's the way to get to the front page. And to do that, you really have to have something for a local paper, something that's gonna be of really big local interest, or if it's national or global or regional, that it really has a, a big effect in that region. Now that, that kind of leads into um, the next piece and we want to stay on time because we have a lot of information to cover. Um, I want to have a little bit of discussion about, uh, you know, what um, are some ideas for our letters to the editor that are specific to Arizona and are things that are timely and current right now. And um, I'm going to start with a, a, you know, an article I found in the Sunday, Sunday paper, um, actually just inside of the front page. Um, it was not very big, but um, the Arizona Republic uh, published an article uh, from Seth Bornstein, who is, I think, an ape, an, a national reporter. And um, Seth um, wrote about um, a new report that's come out from the new from the UN um, that is um, uh, from. Um, called Making Peace with Nature. This is, this is actually the report, I don't, I don't think it's gonna show up, but it, the headline says, UN, huge changes needed to keep nature and earth okay. And I just thought that was really a good overall topic. Um, they, you know, he basically says, we need to make huge changes so that the earth will be okay. Um, He's, uh, humans are making Earth a broken and increasingly unlivable planet. 
through climate change, biodiversity, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Um, you know, I think the the subject of this article is is a really good starting spot if somebody wants to start to write a letter to the editor. Uh, probably is not me for the Arizona Republic. Maybe I'll try it for someone else. Um, I was thinking about, I was playing around about tying around, uh, 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 playing around with uh, the fact that last week I learned that I am going to be a first time great grandmother. Um, I have a little, little girl on the way, Ava, and I was thinking about talking about how that, um, I was incredibly excited, but then there's kind of a dark cloud uh, hanging over just because of what's happening with climate change. You know, this is an example of just using your um, your own personal story in some way and linking that personal story in with what's being said in the media. And I just encourage you to use that. So do we, others have ideas that they would like to share of things that you think we might write some op-eds on this month? Well, and one, one other point that we didn't cover in, in the discussion of print media, um, once you get a letter to the editor published, they probably won't publish you, publish you again the next day or maybe even for the next five days or so. So, um, a friend of mine had a letter to the editor published yesterday. And I advised him then, since he wouldn't get published again for the next few days, to set, send his next letter to another local newspaper or to the Arizona Republic. You know, and I gave him a whole list of alternatives. And I mentioned also in the chat, uh, we do have, NASCA has a very large Arizona media contact list. It includes newspapers, radio, television, and, and, and all sorts of things. And if anybody wants a copy of it, I put my email address in the chat, stefan.somer at nau.edu. If you would like a copy of that Arizona media contacts list, please just send me an email. I'll be happy to forward it. It to actually you. will be in, the link to it will be in the follow-up email that you'll receive. So everybody will. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. And Thank you, Hazel. All the information about the Arizona Republic and their Daily Sun. And I also um, did some contact information for Channel 15 News. Channel 15 has been extremely good about doing uh, newscasts that link climate change, uh, especially their weather reporter, Amber Sullins. I don't know whether you've seen any of her special pieces, but she's done some really masterful pieces um, that link uh, climate change and um, um, special events and what's going on. She did some really great things last summer with extreme heat. Uh, she also did a, a wonderful Valentine's Day um, weather report that uh, talked about how climate change was going to uh, make it difficult to get their chocolate. She did another one about uh, how we're going to lose our coffee. Um, you know, she would be a really good, uh, good person to reach out to and, um, and see if we can get Channel 15 to do um, some stories this month. Um, Channel 15 actually back in 20... 2007, 2008, we were having a huge problem with, with air pollution in the Phoenix area with PM10. And um, we had a, an EPA mandate that if we didn't clean it up, we'd lose $200, $200 million in road funds. And so there was a huge focus on getting legislation through that we clean that air, their air up. And they did a half hour town hall on the air quality. And I would sure love to see them do a half hour town hall on climate because I think they, they did such a good job. They had um, health people, they had 
uh, elected officials. They had Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. I was on because I was with the Asthma Coalition at that time. Um, I can't remember all the all the people, but it was it was really an amazing um, piece, and they actually uh, said that it was one of the best um, watched uh, town halls that they had done. So there might be some openness if somebody has some time to really work with Channel 15 to do a town hall. <laughs> so um, just an idea. We need to use our creativity. Also, don't forget that um, local radio stations, radio stations, especially like up on Navajo Nation and um, in, in our real, real parts of our state are always looking for people to, to talk um, uh, on, their radio, on their radio stations. And, and so reaching out to the radio station list that Stefan has in his document, I just really, really encourage that as well. And Thank you, Hazel. Uh, I should mention that I forgot completely at the beginning, Bonnie, and I'm so sorry. Bonnie is our moderator today. So um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. We don't want to uh, unmute everybody just because when two people speak at the same time, they, they lock each other out. But Bonnie is our moderator. And so if you put a question in the chat, she will voice your question and we'll get an answer. And Bonnie, is, uh, Bonnie will also be putting on a writing workshop this next week. So I'm hoping she'll tell us about that. <laughs> I, I will be happy to mention that as we get toward the end. You know, I will say for myself, you know, y'all are talking about newspapers, you're talking about radio, or, or even if we can get some television coverage. When Stefan first mentioned media madness, you know, frankly, the first thing that popped into my mind was social media. And I do tend to use on Facebook, I don't use other forms of social media, but on Facebook, I do tend to use the story function and most of the time what I'm putting there and it's there for 24 hours is something that is climate related. And so, you know, it's going to be a part of our program tonight. Catherine is going to be talking with us about using social media in our efforts. And did we have any more suggestions as to can. how we can get more outreach? We need to move on to Catherine. Thank you. Um, my name is Catherine and I'm a data marketer. I'm sharing some links in the chat right now. So let me share my screen as well, so you can see the presentation. Hopefully everybody can see that now. So if you go to my website, um, you can see here I have the NASCA Twitter takeover. So I've officially taken over the Twitter profile for NASCA for the entire month of March. And I'm really excited about that. Um, I have some ideas for my campaign for Twitter, but I won't go through all of that because I'm gonna go through this slideshow here down at the bottom, um, which has a bunch of links and stuff for everybody, uh, for mostly for Facebook, um, but there's some Instagram tips in here as well. So we'll just go through that. So first of all, talking about which platforms um, specifically nonprofits use. And this is a old graphic, um, it's a few years old, but it's still you know, pretty, pretty accurate. Um, nonprofits mostly use Facebook and Twitter, although they do use LinkedIn as well um, for a lot of fundraising. Um, but I, I think NASCA has most, um, success right now on Facebook, and we're going to try and move um, 
some followers to Twitter, not move. Uh, we're gonna try to share some followers on Twitter and gain some more. Um, so this, this graphic is from, a link, it's from an article on Buffer. So if you click this, you can read a bunch of tips on social media for nonprofits in particular. But I like this one third, one third, um, one third appreciation, advocacy, and appeals con content ratio. So one third of your content is recognizing your donors, your supporters, your volunteers, and your employees. And I think NASCA does a really, really good job doing that already. Most of the content that I've seen is, is all about volunteers and, and the wonderful things you're doing. So that's really cool. Um, the next third is advocacy. So that's sharing content um, from other nonprofits like the Union of Concerned Scientists um, articles and things like that that you think could help your, uh, your users as well as theirs. And then the second, the third third um, would be solicitations for donations and help. Um, this slide is from the Modern Nonprofit and it just goes through the different social media channels and what types of, uh, what types of people are on them and what, what you can use them for. So um, Twitter in particular, I found that it's a, it's a more liberal audience and it's also a younger audience than Facebook. So the types of content that I would post on Twitter would be different than on Facebook. And that's why I chose climate change memes as one of my um, campaigns for social media on Twitter this month. Um, types of content that do well, imagery, always, always a really good bet. And as you can see from these images over here, you do really, really powerful images. I mean, your protests, uh, the shoe strike, all of that, it, it's just very visually appealing. And so these are the types of things that get shared more often than heavy text posts and things like that. So um, on Facebook and Instagram um, and Twitter, I would share a lot of images. Um, on Facebook and Instagram, you can tag people. And these are links here to specific how-to articles on how to tag people on Facebook and Instagram. So if you have a, a photo and somebody follows you on your Facebook page, you know, you could tag Carrie in this, in this photo. Uh, and the third tip for images is to help the visually impaired. So there's a thing called alt text. And um, for people who use screen readers, they don't know what's in your image unless you put alt text associated with it. So um, I always do that on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter because they allow that. And again, these links link to specific how-to articles on how to add that alt text. So, you know, the alt text that I would put for this image down here would be whatever is how you would describe the image to somebody who can't see it. So I would say, you know, several pairs of shoes on, on a concrete step with um, love your mother earth and save our future sign for the shoe strike. Next is video. Uh, the goal of each social media platform is to keep you on their platform. So when I talk about native video, that's video that's uploaded directly to the platform, not um, sharing a link from YouTube. So if you do this, if you share a link from YouTube on your Facebook, it will get prioritized less um, than if you, upload that video directly to the Facebook page. So Facebook really wants to compete with YouTube. That's why the video length is upwards of, you know, 240 minutes. So um, you can put basically all your videos on Facebook natively. Instagram and Twitter, you have more limitations because, you know, they, they want shorter videos. But 
I would always add the video uploaded when you can. And um, the same thing goes with adding closed captioning or subtitles to your videos. That really helps search engines um, find the videos as well as you know people who need those closed captioning and subtitles. And if you click on this link, you can see a video that I uploaded directly to Twitter. Um, hashtags. Uh, there are several tools you can use to research hashtags. I like hashtagify me and uh, keywordtool.io. So I can just bring up what these look like. My bar is in the way. Oops. So you can see here on the keyword tool, there's several different um, options to choose from. I chose Instagram and I just typed in climate change. And what it's doing is it's evaluating what I typed in um, and it's gonna bring up related hashtags to this. So here we go. So um, sometimes it'll show you the numbers here. Sometimes it, it won't. It depends on how many times you've come, come to this site <laughs> for free because <laughs> it wants you to pay for it. Um, but I'm a millennial, so I won't do that. So um, this is just a bunch of different hashtags, um, ideas that you could plug into to Instagram. And then on the hashtag if I me, I did the sim similar and you can see Twitter suggestions and Instagram up here. And it will bring up a word cloud of relevant hashtags. Um, you can get a paid account. It also will show you um, influencers who are uh, you know, using those hashtags and, and other statistics and things like that. So these are really great tools when you want to expand your, um, your audience outside of the people who already follow you. Uh, I would like to say to keep in mind that um, on Facebook, hashtags only benefit you if you're posting on a business page. So me, Catherine Siri Marco, as an individual, if I post using a hashtag on Facebook, it means virtually nothing. But if Nazca, as a business, posts on their business page, then that hashtag will be searchable within um, the platform and that post will be able to be found. Um, some basic etiquette. On Instagram, you can use as many hashtags as you want. You're never going to offend anybody. People on Instagram love hashtags, so just load it up. On Facebook, I would say you're probably going to be pretty annoying if you use more than five. Um, you're also not going to be using like super relevant hashtags if you're using more than five per post. And on Twitter, because there's a, a cap limit on you know the length of your tweet, you should really only be using one or two per post, or else it looks pretty spammy and people tend to ignore your post. Some Facebook hacks. Um, you can invite your friends to follow your page. So this get, these links give specific instructions on how to do this. Um, so Bonnie, if you're, um, invited to manage the Facebook page, then you can go on and invite your friends to follow that page. And it sends them a special message in their inbox and you get a lot better response of people following the page. If you do that, um, you can also invite people who reacted to a page's post. So a really cool way to do this is to get as many of your followers as, as you can to use this little share button down here and to share the post in hopes that people in their network like or comment on their share. 
um, because then the moderator of the page can go through and um, invite all of those people to follow the page. So in terms of engagement, you know, a lot of people just like or love a post and that's pretty easy to do. So that doesn't get prioritized as much as when somebody comments on a post or when somebody shares a post. Um, if somebody shares a post, that's gonna get upped, upped in the algorithm a lot more than a post that just gets liked. Then there is social media automation. So I use the, the platform buffer and you can see I have screenshots here. Um, this is the exact same platform and I'll pull it up live too so we can see what it looks like. Uh, but this is what I'm using for Twitter and there is a free account so you can attach this to your personal Facebook and you can schedule posts and it will go out um, at the time you, you schedule it. So I have a bunch of my memes in here. Um, I have the articles from the Union of Concerned Scientists that were shared. I also have just a bunch of um, links and information that I took off of the NASCA website as well. And um, if you like the calendar view, see if this comes up. <laughs> You can see here, I have all of my posts in here. So you can see, it's very easy for me to see I'm missing the 17th here and I need to schedule something. And I can even click on these and see what they are. Oh, it doesn't like Zoom. <laughs> there we go. Well, it doesn't like Zoom as much, but um, I really like this because I don't like to go on social media all the time. I find that it, you know, kind of overtakes my day. And so I'll just schedule, I'll take an hour out of my day and just schedule a bunch of stuff all at once. And then it goes out, um, you know, on the schedule and I don't have to worry about it. And finally, um, I'll let you explore these on your own, but these are some resources that I, as a marketer, have used before. Uh, Fiverr.com is a place where a bunch of freelancers go um, and they post like their talent. So you can hire somebody to do a video voiceover. Um, I hire, hired my meme guy from this Fiverr.com. I've made a Muppets video for a nonprofit before and a bunch of cool different things. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Barbara. Yep. Catherine, in, in the interest of, of time, uh -huh. thank you so very much. And then yeah. all of these will be available in the recording that will be shared. Yep, absolutely. And they're all on my website that I shared as well. Excellent. Excellent. And then Hazel, uh, wrapping up and where are we going from here? Well, is everybody excited about March Media Madness? You ready? You ready to sh to turn our climate into one of our number one uh, articles in 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 this in March and establish relationships that we can keep going up forever? Um, you know. We've had a lot of really good information here. We could go on, I mean, you know, talking about media and uh, relationships with media could, could be, you know, many, many, many um, uh, sessions and um, people, of course, get uh, bachelors and masters and doctorates in 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 media, but um, you know I think we have some basics here. And what I just wanted to say is, 
every single one of us can do something to reach out to media. Um, we have something to say. We can talk from our heart. Uh, we may have to submit 20, 30 articles before we get something published, but we're making that effort. And when our media's inbox is absolutely flooded with, re with letters to the editors and op-eds and whatever on climate, they realize how important it is to people. So I, there is nothing more important in my book um, to, to do than to do something, reach out uh, in your own way, find a partner to work with, um, come together with various groups, um, join with us um, in various ways. Um, we um, have a little short poll that we would like each one to commit to do one or two or three or four things. I'm going to launch the poll and I'll give you a minute or two to, to do it. We actually have two different questions, so we'll do them separately. So I'm going to launch this poll. And it's a multiple choice. Mark all of them that you would like to do. And, um, and then we'll take a look at it when we're finished. Oh, it looks like we've had a lot of social media and letters is the editor. <laughs> It's not letting me uh, record my responses. Uh, I, I did. I did want to mention the origin of the term "March Media Madness" came from the college basketball obsession that USA <clears throat> Americans have. So, uh, <clears throat> Professor Summer was cleverly parlaying uh, that into "March Media Madness" for the climate, and uh, and doing that. Um, one sort of uh, kind of bizarre note is that the Guardian newspaper of London actually published in September 2020 the first ever op-ed written by an, an artificial intelligence robot. So that's kind of uh, uh, jarring to hear. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if I can try this uh, poll again. I would like to. Alfred, to you're. You're a co-host, so you will not be able to do it. Okay. Okay. I think we've settled down, so I I will end polling on that one. Um, I will um, quickly share the results, and then we'll go to the second polling. 73% uh, said they're going to write a letter to the editor, um, almost half op-ed. Um, social media outreach and other are probably the bigger, other bigger ones. Um, but there's considerable people that, that want to reach out with the story idea too. Um, so we have one more question. I'm, um, I'm going to stop sharing results and launch the other poll. Uh, we want to know how you heard about this, the, this um, um, and actually Union of Concerned Scientists didn't get it on here. So if you if you heard about it from Union of Concerned Scientists, click Elders Climate Action. <laughs> Oh, I've got to launch it. I'm sorry. There we go. No. No. No, that's the same one again. Yeah, I do. yeah I'll launch. Okay. Okay, we should be launched again. Mm, that's the first one again. Okay, let's try again. Okay, let's see. There we go. I 
I think it's exciting that we have people that have come in from a, a bunch of different things. Uh, just while you're still there's uh, still voting, um, I just want to mention that um, that every Friday uh, we meet uh, statewide and um, uh, with for the Arizona Climate Action Coalition, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, I will make sure that the in the email that goes out as a follow up from this, the information on the Friday meeting is on it, and we'd love to have you join us. We are representing all kinds of climate groups and uh, from all across the state, interfaith, intergenerational, and multicultural. And we share what we're doing and what we're going on. And um, it's a pretty interesting and powerful event. So uh, hopefully you'll um, um, be able to join us on our for a Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, so I think, do we have call, any, anyone wanting to, oh, we need uh, to turn it over to Bonnie to talk about her writing workshop. Oh, thank you very much, Hazel. This truly has been amazing. We've had, since I'm monitoring the chat box, we've had an awful lot of thank you. This was fantastic information. And indeed it was. Everyone should watch for the follow-up email. Hazel, that's coming from you, I believe. And coming from Jenna. Okay. And it will have links to all of those fabulous resources that Hazel was mentioning and that are going to help us with all of the outreach we're planning. What I am going to be focused on specifically is a writing workshop. I happen to spend a couple of decades working in communications, sales, marketing with a large multinational corporation. And I've had a number of years with Toastmasters International and hold a advanced communicator gold communication or uh, designation there. We realize that people learn differently. You know, for me personally, I can take Hazel's resources and I can dig through those. That works for me. But we also know that there are some people that are going to learn better in more of a workshop environment. That's why we're putting it together. It is going to be next Tuesday evening, one week from today, in this same time frame, starting at 5.30 and Mountain Standard Time. Uh, I had put it out there as an approximately one hour workshop. If we're done in 47 minutes, we're not going to make people hang around. But if you're the kind of person that learns well in a workshop environment, then please do plan to join us. We'll go a little deeper, more specifically on uh, letters and email. So how, do people, how do people sign up for your workshop, Ms. Lane? Uh, you'll find it on the NASCA website. I just dropped a link in the chat box too, if you wanted to click on it. Excellent, thanks. And we'll add it to the follow-up email. Um, I, ju I just, I just want to thank everybody so much for coming uh, tonight. I'm really excited about um, March of Media Madness, and I want, I'm so excited that there's so many people that are, are participating and are wanting to do it. it. It's our voices that are going to change the world. It's our voices that are going to give my little Eva, my new, uh, emerging uh, granddaughter, which is great because I have four grandsons. So <laughs> my granddaughter, uh, a world that she can live in. And so forever, I wanna thank you because it's, it's your work and your actions and everything that you do that will allow these babies that are being born today to, to um, be able to graduate from high school in a world that's still livable. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Anybody else have any final thoughts that they want to throw in? Well, Professor well, Summer, um, Professor well, Summer has been trying to get the March Media Madness concept spread to other places beyond Arizona. 
and and uh, has been really diligently uh, and amazingly uh, wor working to uh, sp spread spread the, uh, the, uh, the, the awareness of this and get people engaged in other places as well. Well, that's what I was gonna say too, is for all of us, not just to write letters. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for writing letters and best of luck on getting them published, but also tell your friends and family and whatever organization you are a member of, please spread the word. If anybody needs a copy of the flyer or any of the promotional materials, again, you could just email me at at the email I put into the chat. And then Hazel also has a form where you can report your actions and um, there will be a way to, I believe, post your letters, whether they're successfully published or not. We are interested in what you write and uh, we'll get them posted within our own networks. So maybe Hazel, do you wanna tell people about the form? I, I developed a Google form, which the link will be in the follow-up email. Um, I, we want to have a way that we can keep track across all of our organizations who does uh, things, who submits letters, who has reached out uh, to whom. Um, and it's just a simple Google form. I'm going to put a place to upload a PDF or, um, to it. And so if you've got a, an article or something that you've written, if you turn it into PDF form, it'll allow you to update, update it. Or we'll get it in a, a, a spreadsheet that we can all use so we can track it. And so we know, kind of know um, what's going on. I encourage you to submit, submit one for each action you take um, and um, social media included. Uh, if you're doing daily social media, you can do a summary for the week and just kind of list the kinds of things you did with social media. But um, I would appreciate it as much as possible because if we can show, you know, the magnitude of our our outreach, um, I think is incredibly important for for all of us and all the organizations that we represent. Well, if we have nothing else, um, thank you, everybody. I mean, this has been amazing. Um, I hope you got some useful information and let's get writing. I mean, let's celebrate March Media Madness, you know. It's a lot better than celebrating uh, March Madness, <laughs> which is just a sports that I can't, I can't seem to follow. So um, let's do March Media Madness this year.